So, new heaven and new earth. We are at the end, church, uh, even though the end isn't, may, may, may come after we preach today. Like, Jesus might come back. Uh, we'll see what happens. But um, we have been in a sermon series called The Greater Story since January of 2022. And I know not all of you have been with us over that time, um, but I have, and it's been a long, a long haul. But it's been so good to start in Genesis 1, and today we get to Revelation 21 and 22, the last chapters of the Bible, and see this new heaven and a new earth. And so it's a monumental day that we're finally ending this greater story sermon series that, that we've been in, um, and, and praise God that we have uh, been able to see those huge stories over time. And I wanted to ask you, though, um, since we're here at the end, what do you think the end is going to be like? What do you think heaven is going to be like? Okay, yeah, yes. Popular, popular opinion though is something more like this, sitting on a cloud, <laughs> having angel wings and a halo wishing you'd brought a magazine, because sitting around on a cloud all day is boring, okay? Or maybe you think of harps when you get into, into heaven. And so if you get into heaven and you are given a harp, well then, what happens when you go to hell? Accordions. I don't know. My, my wife plays accord, played accordion a long time ago? In a talent show. In a talent show. Nice. Whatever. <laughs> Moving on. Um, or perhaps when, when you think you're going you're gonna to die, you're going to go up to, to the pearly gates, and St. Peter is going to meet you there, and he's going to ask you a question that you don't know how to answer, and it's a math problem. And, and, and it's, it's this. Go ahead and put it up there. Oh, this one has trouble. I'm sorry. So the, the, there was this comic. Just click on it once and then let, let it, see if it pops up. Um, it, it's a math problem. Say a train leaves uh, Philadelphia at 4 p.m. traveling 60 miles an hour, and then a train also leaves Denver at 4 p.m. Um, traveling... Oh, wait. Do you need some scratch paper to figure this out? <laughs> and you can't answer St. Peter's question in order for the pearly gates to open and you go into heaven. Maybe that's your fear. You don't know the answer to that question. And these popular ideas of heaven being in the clouds and we're just singing forever and, and all these things, this has been, a lot of that has been influenced by medieval art. Um, there, there was a play a long time ago called Dante's Inferno, which talked about like several levels of hell and levels of heaven. And, and that's one of those images that came out of that was where Satan looks like this, the devil character with like a tail and a pitchfork and pointy ears. And that, that, that's from that time period. That description of Satan is not in scripture at all. That was just a way to depict something that was evil, in, especially in the medieval period. And so what really is heaven? Because that's a lot of our imagery that we get in pictures and paintings that doesn't necessarily come from the Bible. Yes, there's like Jesus comes on the clouds, and yet we're actually going to go meet him and then escort him right back down to earth. Because the idea behind that is the Greek word parousia. Say parousia. Go. Parousia. That is a Greek word that the Romans used when, hey, our, our Caesar is coming. He won a foreign battle, and we, he's, he's parousia-ing. He, he's coming back. We need to go out and meet him on the road and escort him back into town because he's a conquering king. He's victorious. And when Paul says Jesus is going to come, that's what we're going to do. We're, we at, who believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior are going to meet him. The image is often up in the clouds, but then we're going to escort him right back down to earth. Because this is where his domain belongs. Heaven and earth belong together. And it always has been that way, but something went wrong. Something went wrong in Genesis chapter 3 that caused heaven and earth to separate. And it caused it to split. And ever since then, we've been trying to get back to where heaven and earth merge together. And we finally see it here in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So what we're going to look at today, I have one statement. If you take notes, just write one thing down, that God is with you. And that's it. It's going to be simple. We're going to put some flesh and bones and, and tissue onto that skeleton of a sentence. But that's it. That God is with you if you've confessed him as your Lord and Savior, and he can be with you, and he's like right next to you if you haven't. He's desiring you to turn to him. So let's go ahead and jump in and see how is God with us now? How is God going to be with us in, in a brand new way later on? So let's go ahead and read Revelation 22. We'll read the first four verses here. Remember, this is apocalyptic imagery. And so um, if you like beaches and snorkeling and scuba diving, 
don't worry, um, because I'll explain it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. That's what I'm talking about. If you like to scuba dive, this is bad news for you. Except, again, it's imagery we'll talk about in a second. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So let's talk about that sea imagery. If you're a Jewish person in the first century and previous, the sea represented chaos to you. The Jewish people were not a seafaring people, except for those crazy Galilean fishermen, and even they got in trouble. They went out when there were storms and crazy stuff happened, and Jesus had to to fix things. Um, But the sea, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, is the Hebrew is tovu vavohu. It's like wild and, and waste. It's chaotic, it's watery, it's dark, it's void of life. And God's spirit is hovering over that deep, dark, chaotic sea before he begins to speak, to divide, to create, and make the earth habitable for life, which is good. And that is contrary to this chaotic wateriness, which is the sea. So in this end vision, the sea is gone. That means that there's no more chaos. There's no more deep, dark wateriness that is void of life. God's presence and life-giving attributes fills creation completely. It is everywhere. There's not a section of the earth that has any chaos anymore because evil has been revealed and removed in the previous chapters of this vision of Revelation. Now let's talk about this one, passed away. So the, the first earth and the first heaven had passed away. In English parlance, what does that mean? When you say something passed away, it mean, means it died. Someone or something has, has passed away means that their life has ceased, they have died. But that's not what this Greek means here. There's, there's a play going back and forth between the new and the passing away. So this passing away is, is just really a common word for means it, it went away. So if I walked out the door, I just went away. And that'd be weird if I did that right now, but that's, that's the idea. So the first heaven and the first earth, are just, they, just, they just went away. Like that they're not in view anymore because there's something that is new that's coming. And from the whole council of scripture, I want to make sure you know that it's not that this earth and heaven um, is like crumpled up and just tossed in and stomped on by, by God. There's still something here, but it's a shadow of its former self. A couple weeks ago, I preached on Revelation 4 and 5, and I continued into chapter 6 and 7 and explained how when we see the, these cycles of seven, which Drew mentioned a little bit as well, there's seven seals, which turn into seven trumpets, which turn into seven bowls. Each of those are revealing evil, exposing it for what it is, and then getting rid of it, judging it, throwing it into the lake of fire, burning it. It's gone. If all evil is, is removed from this earth, can you imagine what wouldn't be here? There'd be a lot of stuff that, that would be gone. Evil, if evil is just gone, the earth is a shadow of its former self. And so the, what that was, what the first earth and the first heaven were had just gone away. Something new, something regenerative had to come. And God himself is making all things new. He says so in the next verse. And he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And that is what Jesus came to do by revealing and removing that evil so that this new heaven and new earth can finally come down. Now, down in verse 9, we continue this wedding imagery. We get this bride up here in verse 2, and and there's more of that here in verse 9. So here's Revelation 21, verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And many times in Revelation, we have seen that John hears something, but he sees something different, and the two are related. He hears, behold, the lion of Judah, but he sees a lamb. Behold, the the people of Israel, 144,000, but he turns and sees a multitude from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And the same thing happens here. Behold, see the bride, and what does he see? Verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me 
the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and the gates of the 12 angels, and, and gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So the bride is the city, but the bride, in other New Testament language, is the church is the people. I remember dude did this once. You have the, here's the church, here's the steeple, open it up and there's all the people, okay? That the church is the people. It's not just a building, but the church is the people. So the people is the church, is the bride, is the city. So the people of God are the city, is the city of God. And what we see here also, this is one of my favorite things, is an Old Testament reference back to Numbers. Yes, my, one of my favorite books is Numbers. Um, and we see a, a, a replication of this city as the uh, tribes were set up when God's presence came and dwelt with them in the tabernacle. So we just got to rewind like 14 months to when we were talking about Exodus. Moses leads the people through the Red Sea and then they go to Mount Sinai. God calls Moses up to Mount Sinai and says, I want to make a covenant with these people, and I want to be their God, I want them to be my people. And they agree, and so God gives them instructions for a tent called the tabernacle. And so they, they go and build this tabernacle where um, they, they have kind of a threefold construction. There's an outer courtyard, there is the holy place, and then there's the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And that is where God actually came and lived. He came in, in a pillar of fire and smoke, a huge, great rushing wind, and he came and lived there among his people. And then he told them, okay, you need to arrange yourselves around me so that there's some protection because my presence is holy and it's not great for you who's still kind of a sinful, rebellious person to interrupt, enter my presence. And so he just set cl very clear boundaries. The tabernacle was at the middle, the priests were around him, and then there were three tribes to the north, three tribes to the south, three to the East, I'm getting my directions mixed up. And then three, the other way, okay, whichever it was. And we see that replicated here. There's three gates on every single side of, of the city, and, and their, their names are the tribes of Israel. There's a replication of this city and what God had set up way back in the book of Numbers. And the apostles are also here. They're, they are the foundations of the earth. Now let's keep going, and then we're going to get to Genesis 1. And the one who spoke, this is verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square. Here's another image that confirms it's the people of God. A square in Revelation is the people of God. There were 144,000, which is a square, uh, a square number when you take 12 times 12,000. And so that's the people of God. Its length is the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod 12,000 stadia. A stadia is like 607 feet or something. If you want to do math, feel free, but we're moving on because I can't do that. Um, its length and width and height are, e are, are equal. So not only is it a square, the city lies four square, but also it's a cube. Its length and width and height are the exact same measurement. My friends, this is where it gets really interesting. There is one other place in the Bible where something is described as a cube, and it is the very presence of God in the tabernacle and the temple. That most holy place, the holy of holies, what in the tabernacle was 10 cubits wide, 10 cubits deep, and 10 cubits tall. In um, the temple, when King Solomon built it, it was 20 cubits wide, 20 cubits deep, and 20 cubits tall. Apparently, there was more presence of God to be had when they actually had a temple than the tabernacle. My friends, if you believe in Jesus and you call him your savior, you are the temple of God. This is the imagery that this is communicating because if you believe in Jesus, this picture of the city, the bride, the church, you, the people coming down out of heaven is the dwelling place of God. You and God are in the same place. It is the exact same place. And this has been God's goal from the very beginning. Let's go and explore. Genesis chapter 1. God creates the earth. 
and he divides things, he speaks, he orders it, he creates, and eventually he creates, he, he, he forms a man out of the dust of the earth, and he takes him and places him in a garden that he had formed in Eden that was in the east. Genesis chapter 2 says as much. There's a threefold construction in the Garden of Eden. There's the garden in Eden in the east. The presence of God is dwelling with man, with Adam and Eve, in the garden. God is said to walk among them in, in the cool of the day, later in Genesis chapter 3. He wanted to be with us, and he gave us a mission to expand the borders of that garden. He told, he told the first humans, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, just like I have begun to subdue this little outpost of my goodness in this world that I've begun to create. And so our mission, dear church, was in the beginning to expand the borders of Eden until it covered all of creation. That is what the image of God truly is. It's to rule and reign, to, to have, have kids if you can and, and expand the borders of Eden. If you don't have kids, there are ways, of course, to expand your little corner of Eden, your garden of delight, that's what Eden means. But something, something went wrong. We, we mucked it up. Instead of trusting in God for his goodness, we took the knowledge of what was good and evil for ourselves so that we could define it on our own terms. And so we stopped trusting in God and started trusting in ourselves. And it didn't work. Death came very, very quickly. And th three chapters later, after Genesis chapter three, where that story of the humanity's rebellion against God happens, we get the entire earth is infected with sin. God has to send the flood and cleanse the earth, just like a fire will cleanse the prairie so that new life can happen again. And he starts over with Noah, who's in an ark with a lower, a middle, and an upper deck. He comes out, he plants a garden, and he's also naked. It's not a good reason why he's naked, if you know the story. But once again, we, we find a garden, we find the presence of God, and we find a man who has no clothes just like Adam did in the beginning. But again, it, it doesn't go well. And so God has, for, for God to dwell with his people again, he has to do something different. He kind of has to change strategies, and that's what he does with Abram. So he asks Abram, hey, you're going to be my guy, and you are going to bring from yourself a people who will be my people, and through you I will save the world. And that's eventually what happens. He saves that people who's Israel, uh, and we talked about this at Mount Sinai, created a covenant, they became a nation of Israel. God dwelt with them in the wilderness and in Israel, and everything was good until it got mucked up again. And so through this one man of, of David comes a line where, where there's this idea in, in the prophecies uh, of the Bible that there, it's like someone's going to come. God has to come down and dwell with us again. And the common idea was that there was going to be another temple. And so they built a second temple, but God actually never came and lived there. There wasn't this rushing wind and fire that came down from heaven like it used to. And so the Israelites from about the year 500 BC on are just saying, God, where are you? What's going on? When are you going to come back and live with us again? And we turn the page to the New Testament, and Jesus shows up. John, one of the close followers of Jesus, started to, to realize something, uh, and, and he, he begins his gospel account uh, of Jesus' life in a unique way. Here's what he says in verse 9. The true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a, a man or a husband, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word for dwelt is the same word that is used in Greek for tabernacle. It's the word tabernacle made into a verb. So Jesus, the word of God, came down and he tabernacled among us. A lot of people didn't see him, but to those who did see him and worshiped him and called him Lord, he gave the right to become children of God. And that is what Jesus comes down to this earth to do. And, and so, so God was here. He, he did dwell with us through the person of Jesus. We kind of mucked it up again because Jesus was killed. And yet, that was part of God's plan. Because in order for Jesus to be the guy, the savior of the world, the true son of God, God resurrected him and gave him 
a new body, who is like, like the, the first kind of resurrection that, that we see. He's the first fruits. Now, here's, here's an aside, just to, to pause a little bit and, and talk about something. What do you think our resurrected bodies are going to be like? If you believe in Jesus and this time comes where we are resurrected, what do you think we're going to be like? Likely you'll say that we have, well, if, uh, my, my back hurts today, but that's not going to happen in heaven. Or my, I had to have my, my knee replaced, but I'm going to have my bone back in heaven. Or I have this chronic illness, so well, that'll be healed in heaven. I want you to think about this. What was Jesus' body like? The only resurrected body we know about. He still had holes in his hands from where the nails pierced him from the salvific act, the act of salvation that he had on the cross. He still had that hole in his side where a spear pierced him. Jesus bore imperfections on his body, but those imperfections somehow related to salvation. So will our bodies be perfect in heaven? I think we won't experience some of those pains, and yet Jesus himself, and perhaps some of these martyrs who died for the faith, whether they were, I'm not going to talk about how they were killed, but you can imagine, will they also bear scars of their testimony on behalf of Jesus? And will that be a good identifying factor on their resurrected body? I don't know, guys. This is, um, if you listen to the podcast, I don't like to speculate um, but this is one place I'm comfortable speculating in because um, it's, it's really interesting to think about what Jesus' body was like and what, what is our body going to be like. And so Paul clearly identifies Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15 as the first fruits of the resurrection, something that's going to happen to us. At that last trump at the great judgment day, we are going to be raised with him and we will witness the judgment of evil and Satan finally cannot touch us anymore. But that is someday. In the meantime, he writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. He starts to pick up on this idea that God is dwelling with us in a unique and special way because the story that's described in Acts chapter 2 was a filling of God inside of people. That same way that God came and rushed in in fire and wind in the Old Testament to fill the tabernacle and fill the temple came and filled his people in Acts chapter 2. So the, the people are the temple as we have been, been describing, but he begins to pick up on applications of this. Just for example, in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, he writes this, flee from sexual immorality Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexually immoral, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do not, don't you know, like isn't it obvious that you are a temple? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God. You are not your own, you're bought at a price. Therefore, so glorify God in your body. There is this idea that God is living in us and that changes how we behave. That changes who we are. That changes what we need to become. And that's what the Apostle Paul started to pick up on. And as we go forward, we have to think about the implications of that for us. If you've confessed your life to Jesus, what does God living in you, what does God with you actually mean for you? Because it should change you. It, when you commit your life to Jesus, there is the sense that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. There's a seal over you as a, a, ch a child of God. But, but I think there's, a bit, there's more. There's more of God available to fill us so that it flows out of us into the world. And when people are said to be filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what that means, that, that they, they are so much on a trajectory to be like Christ that they just emulate the kingdom of God within themselves. It's as though you're a saint who is, who is no longer a sinner, but you embody your Savior to the world. And we finally get the, this last vision. Yes, the people are the temple. The bride is, is the temple, and God is there, but there's actually no temple. In Revelation 21, this is the end of that chapter, verse 22, it says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. There's not actually a temple, because the people are the temple. This city that encompasses everything is the temple. And this city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Now, Psalm 105 says that your word is a lamp to my feet. Um, is this a flashlight? Can I go out and it's dark and it, can it light my path? No. 
you understand that that's imagery, meaning that that we don't have to see any longer because God shows us the way forward in every single way, and he's there. Just like God was in the garden, in the Garden of Eden walking beside us, God is here in a full way that we, we don't know what it's really going to be like. And by its light, by the light of God, the nations will walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night. So if you're afraid of of not being able to answer St. Peter's question, the, the gates are gonna be open, don't worry. If you see it, the gates will be open for you. And they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the overarching image is that the dwelling place of God and humanity is finally reunited in a great and glorious way. And while we await this completion and, and that, um, like God is already dwelling with us, but it's, it's just not quite as full, it's, not, it's a little less complete. And yet, we know that we have begun to bring our kingdom, to bring God's kingdom to this earth if we let him. And so church, there's times where, where I, I, I'm asking God to figure out how, how are we going to apply this? Like, what, what does this mean for us? And I've already shared some things about, you know, bringing the kingdom into the world, but really what I hope and desire for each of us, myself included, is that these truths sink in. And that we, we go and visit with God. We actually talk with him, say, God, okay, if, if I am a dwelling place, am I, if I'm a temple of your spirit, then how does that change me? What do you want me to do? What have you gifted me specifically to do? Because each of us have different gifts, different ways of bringing the kingdom to the world. Each of us have a different thing to do. And so if there's anything that I would love for you to do after hearing this message of where I, I've attempted to summarize one theme from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is that you ask God, what does it mean for me to be a temple for you? Because hopefully I've explained to you that we are. If you've given your life to Jesus, you are a temple of God and, the, and he can flow through you and fill you and, and, and walk with you in a way that, that some of us might be a little afraid to, to go for, like, oh, the filling of the Holy Spirit, am I gonna fall down? No, it's not how it, how it works. It can work that way, but it hasn't worked for me that way. And I've been on this journey of exploring what, what does it actually mean to, to be a saint who, who knows that God is with me to, to use my gifts, to, to use um, th- these things that God has given me. And, and one of them is, is obviously just being here with you all at Forefront Church and leading music and, and teaching, preaching every once in a while. But there, there are, are, are so many other unique ways. And God has uniquely gifted you to be a part of his kingdom now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for Revelation 21 and 22. It can happen right now. And if you're not a, a believer of Jesus, whenever you're hearing this, if you're here now, if you haven't really said yes to Jesus, man, God is right there with you. And if this is true, if this is true, which I believe it is, obviously, then there's something greater and more glorious awaiting you for your life. Because there's a duality that when you're with Jesus, you bring life and goodness and creation. When you're not, you bring death and evil and darkness. You may not know how it's evil and dark, but there's not a whole lot of gray area in that, unfortunately. What's left after this world will be cleansed of evil is a shadow of its former self. Will the works that you do be a part of that? Or will it be cast away? Will it pass away? Will it just not be relevant anymore? I pray that we contribute to this world in a way that when we see Jesus, he welcomes us in and says, well done, good and faithful servant. And we dwell with God forevermore. Let's finish up and read Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This is Genesis 2, reimagined 
as the city. It has come full circle from the beginning. The garden, the tree is back. The leaves of the tree were the healing for the nations. No longer will there be any accursed, but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they, my friends, that is you, we will reign forever and ever in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray.